three, two. Well, hello again. Glad to have you all here for session number two of God's Prophetic Chain. Uh, we want to have a word of prayer, and then after the word of prayer, we want to uh, review what we studied in our last session, and then we'll get into some new material. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we open your word, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. We ask for understanding. We ask for the willingness to open our hearts and minds to receive what you have for us. Give us your wisdom. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Let's just review what we studied in our first session. We're studying the great prophetic chain. Now, where does the chain begin? With which kingdom? It begins with Babylon, very well. Then it continues with which kingdom? Medo-Persia. Then the third kingdom is what? Greece. The fourth kingdom is? The Roman Empire. But then what happens? The Roman Empire is what? Is divided into ten kingdoms because that fourth beast sprouts ten horns. And then in the midst of the ten horns rises what? A little horn and it becomes big. It's little at first, but then it grows and it becomes larger than its fellows. So in our study today, we are going to attempt to define what is meant by the little horn. We already know that the lion is Babylon, the bear is Medo-Persia, the leopard is Greece, the dragon beast is Rome, the ten horns represent the ten divisions of Rome, but the question is, what is represented by the little horn? I'm going to share with you, as we begin, seven characteristics of the little horn. And I'm going to list them, first of all, and then we are going to look at each of them more carefully. So let's just go through the seven characteristics, first of all, and then we'll amplify each one of them. Number one, the little horn rises after the ten horns are there. So we know when the little horn is going to arise. It has to arise after the ten horns are complete, after the Roman Empire is divided, in other words. Characteristic number two, we know that the little horn must be a, a power that rises in Western Europe, more specifically in Rome. You say, why in Rome? Because the fourth beast represents Rome, and the little horn rises from the head of the fourth beast. So the little horn, in some sense, must be Roman. It rises in Western Europe, more specifically in Rome. The third characteristic is that the little horn uproots three of the ten horns. So we must look to a historical occurrence where the little horn uprooted three of the divisions of the Roman Empire. The last four characteristics are found in Daniel 7, verse 25. We find there in that verse the following words. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. That's characteristic number four. The pompous words are defined in Revelation 13, which we will study tomorrow, Lord's will, Lord willing, uh, is defined as blasphemies. The great words or the pompous words are blasphemies. So the fourth characteristic is that the little horn speaks blasphemies. The fifth characteristic is expressed in verse 25. Once again, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. That's characteristic number five. It would be a power that would persecute God's faithful people. And then we have characteristic number six. It says about the little horn, and he shall intend to change times and law. In other words, this would be a power that would think that it could have the capacity and the power to change God's very law. And the final characteristic is that this little horn was going to rule for a certain period of time. It says at the end of verse 25, Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. And so we have these seven characteristics of the little horn and now we want to take a look at which power fulfills these seven characteristics. However, before we do, I want to emphasize something very important once again. And that is that when we identify the little horn, we are not talking about the individuals represented by the little horn. 
The little horn represents an apostate religious organization. In other words, it represents an apostate system of religion. It doesn't mean that everybody who belongs to that religion is apostate. What it means is that the system itself is an apostate system and it, its condition is irreversible. In other words, it's not going to change according to Bible prophecy. But in that system are many sincere people who love the Lord Jesus with all their hearts. They serve Jesus to the best of their ability according to the knowledge that they have. I want to make that very, very clear. So you say, what is represented by the little horn? Which apostate religious organization is represented by this little horn? I'm going to tell you which power it is, and then we are going to look at the evidence. There is no doubt whatsoever, as we look at the characteristics of the little horn, that there is only one power, one system in the world that fits with every single characteristic, and that is the Roman Catholic Papacy. The little horn represents the Roman Catholic Papacy as a system. It does not represent individuals within the system. It represents the organization, the apostate organization of the Roman Catholic Papacy. So let's look at the seven characteristics to see if they square or they fit with the Roman Catholic Papacy. The first characteristic is that the little horn would rise after the ten horns or the ten divisions of the Roman Empire were complete. Yesterday, I briefly mentioned about the barbarian tribes that came from the northern sector of the empire. And they started carving up what had been the Roman Empire. Some of these uh, kingdoms, I'll, I'll give you the names, and you'll e immediately be able to identify the nations in Europe that descend from these kingdoms. There was the Anglo-Saxons. Where would they be from? They would be from England. You have the Alemanni. You know, in Spanish, German is Alemanes. So the Alemanni are the Germans. You have the Lombards. Where would the Lombards be from? They would be from Italy. You know, you have the famous uh, football coach, Vince Lombardi, which is an Italian name. Uh, you also have the Franks. Which nation came from the Franks? France, of course. And then you have the Visigoths, which arose in Spain. Those are only five of the ten. In other words, the nations of Europe were the result of the divisions of the Roman Empire. Now, in the fourth century, Constantine, the emperor in Rome, decided that he would move the seat of the empire to Constantinople in the east. And so the throne of Caesar in the west was left vacant because in the year 476, the last western Roman emperor was deposed from his throne. His name was Romulus Augustulus. And so basically, Constantine moving the empire, the, the seat of the empire to the east, and the last Roman emperor being deposed in the west allowed now for the Bishop of Rome, whom we know to be the Pope, to occupy the throne that had been left vacant by Romulus Augustulus. In other words, the throne of Caesar became the throne of the Pope of Rome in the year 476 when the last Roman emperor was deposed from his throne in the West. Are you with me or not? And the result of the divisions of the Roman Empire are the nations of Europe today. Each nation with their own language. Each nation with their own culture. Very different than when the Roman Empire was one empire and was united. The empire was fragmented and the nations of Europe are the result of the fragmentation of the empire. So characteristic number one fits the Roman Catholic Papacy very well. Rome was the united empire then it was divided into ten kingdoms, and then the emperor moved to Constantinople. The last emperor was deposed, and this allowed the Roman Catholic Pope to come and occupy the throne that had been occupied by Caesar. The little horn definitely arose after the ten horns were complete and in place. In terms of geography, this is the second characteristic. Where would the little horn arise? 
Obviously, it rises in Western Europe because the ten horns represent the nations of Western Europe. But more specifically, it would be a Roman power because the little horn rises from the head of the fourth beast, and the fourth beast is Rome. The question is, is the papacy a Roman power? Let's look at the characteristics. First of all, what is the name of the church? The Roman Catholic Church. What is its geographical location? Its geographical location is Vatican City in Rome. What is its official language? Latin, the official language of the Roman Empire. What kind of number system does the papacy use? It uses Roman numerals. What is the architecture in the Vatican like? It is Roman architecture. Furthermore, the papacy inherited and transformed the organizational, organizational system of the Roman Empire into an ecclesiastical empire. Let me read you a statement here from a Jesuit scholar by the name of Malachi Martin in his book, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Church how the papacy transformed the organization that it inherited from the Roman Empire. This is how it reads. Within three centuries, the Roman Church had transformed the administrative organization of the Roman Empire into an ecclesiastical system of bishoprics, envoys, representatives, courts of justice, and a criminal system of intricate laws all under the direct control of the pope. His Roman palace, the Lateran, became the new senate. The new senators were whom? The cardinals. The bishops who lived in Rome and the priests and deacons helped the pope to administer this new imperium. In other words, this new empire. So did the papacy inherit the empire from ancient Rome? It most certainly did. It is a Roman power. Furthermore, many of the beliefs and practices of the Roman Catholic Church were inherited from the pagan Roman Empire. Among those pagan practices, for example, was the Day of the Sun. In other words, Sunday as a day of worship came into the church from the ancient Roman Empire. In fact, the first Sunday law was proposed by Constantine in the year 321. He was a pagan at that time. Of course, later on in the year 30, 336, in the Council of Laodicea, this particular uh, Sunday law became a religious Sunday law because at first it was a secular Sunday law and then it became a religious Sunday law. Perhaps you didn't know that the name Supreme Pontiff, Sumo Pontifice, as the Pope is called in Spanish, is a direct importation from the name that was given to the Roman Emperor. The Roman emperor was called Pontifex Maximus, the supreme pontiff, and this is exactly the name that is given to the pope today. He inherited the very name of the Caesars, in other words. Now, I want you to notice a couple of statements from historians, where the historians clearly tell us that the Roman Catholic papacy rose from Rome, takes the place of Rome, geographically speaking. I'm going to pass up the first statement that we find. You can read that at your leisure. I'm going to read the next two, the one that comes from W.F. Berry and the one that is from Adolf Harnack. Notice what is said by W.F. Berry. If we extend our view over the ruins of the Western Empire, such is the spectacle that meets us on every side. The Pax Romana has ceased. The Roman peace has ceased. It is universal confusion, but wherever a bishop holds his court, religion protects all that is left of the ancient order. And now notice this. A new Rome ascends slowly above the horizon. It is the heir of the religion which it has overthrown, which is paganism. It assumes the outward splendors of the Caesars. The emperor is no more. But the Pontifex Maximus abides. He is now the vicar of Christ, offering the old civilization to the tribes of the north. He converts them to his creed, and they serve him as their father and judge supreme. This is the papal monarchy, which in its power and its decline overshadows the history of Europe for how long? 
for a thousand years. Actually, it was more than a thousand years. So is the papacy a Roman power, according to this historian? Absolutely. Notice what Adolf Harnack wrote in his book, What is Christianity? pages 269 and 270. The Roman church, in this way, privately pushed itself into the place of the Roman world empire, of which it is the actual continuation. The empire has not perished, but has only undergone a what? A transformation. It is a political creation and as imposing as a world empire because it is what? The continuation of the Roman Empire. The Pope, who calls himself king and Pontifex Maximus, is Caesar's successor. So let me ask you, is the little horn a Roman power? It most certainly is. It comes from the head of the fourth beast, which is Rome. Once the ten kingdoms are there, the little horn comes up, this Roman horn. Now the third characteristic that we noticed is that this little horn would uproot three of those ten horns, or three of those ten kingdoms. Now the ten kingdoms were complete by the year 476. In other words, by the year 476, when the last Western emperor was deposed, the empire had been divided into ten kingdoms. But there was a problem that the papacy had after the year 476. And that is that there were three of the ten kingdoms that did not agree with the theology of the Roman Catholic Church. Particularly, they believed that Jesus Christ was a created being. They did not believe that Jesus was eternal God. These three kingdoms were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. And so the papacy was desirous of uprooting these three rebellious kingdoms, three of the ten rebellious kingdoms. And so what happened is that the Pope encouraged Theodoric of the Ostrogoths to go against Odoacer, the king of the Heruli, because the Heruli were one of the kingdoms that were rebellious to the papacy. And thus it was that in the year 493, Odoacer of the Heruli was killed by Theodoric of the Ostrogoths. And Theodoric was sent by the papacy to uproot the Heruli. And they were uprooted in the year 493. And there is no kingdom in Europe today that descends from the Heruli. Then you have a second kingdom which was rebellious, the Vandals. And in the year 534, the papacy influenced the emperor, Justinian, who was now the emperor in the east, but he had a lot to say about the west. The pope encouraged the emperor to send armies to fight against the Vandals. And in the year 534, the Vandals were uprooted from history. There is no nation in Europe that descends from the Vandals. There was one rebellious kingdom that was left, the Ostrogoths. And in the year 533, the... Uh, Army general Belisarius was sent to do war against the Ostrogoths. To make a long story short, in the year 538, the Ostrogoths suffered a devastating defeat. They were expelled from Rome. Even though they existed until the year 550, they no longer had any power and they disappeared from history after the year 538. And so, exactly the way history points it out, the papacy influenced the emperor to go against these three rebellious kingdoms. The Heruli were uprooted in the year 493, the Vandals were uprooted in the year 534, and the Ostrogoths were uprooted in the year 538. I want you to notice the statement that was made by uh, the emperor Justinian about the Pope. It says, therefore, he's writing a letter actually to Pope John, therefore we have exerted ourselves, that is the emperors, to unite all the priests of the East and subject them to your, holy, to your holiness, because you are the head of all the churches, for we shall exert ourselves in every way, as has already been stated, to increase the honor and authority of your see. What's significant about this statement? 
What's significant is that the emperor is saying, you are the head of all the churches, and the state is going to put forth all of its effort to make sure that everybody obeys you as the head of all of the churches. Since when is the state supposed to guarantee the unity of the church and the obedience of people, members to the church? It's interesting to notice Characteristic number four. Are you clear in the first three characteristics now? Is the papacy a Roman power? Yes. Did it rise to power after the divisions of the Roman Empire? Yes. Did it uproot three of the ten kingdoms? It most certainly did. Now, the fourth characteristic is that the little horn would speak blasphemies against the Most High. Now, we must allow the Bible to interpret what blasphemy is. You know, most people today, when you say blasphemy, they think of somebody who raises their hand in defiance against God, maybe some atheist who claims that God doesn't exist, and maybe even uses bad language to curse God. That's the idea that people have about blasphemy today. But we should allow the Bible to define blasphemy, not the dictionary in the 21st century. How does the Bible define blasphemy? Well, it defines it in two ways. The first way is blasphemy means when a mere man claims to have the power to forgive sins. Let's notice Mark chapter 2 and verse 7. Mark chapter 2 and verse 7. Jesus had just said to a paralytic, your sins are forgiven. And of course the Jewish leaders were furious with him because they considered that he was a mere man. And so they said, this man is speaking blasphemies. Who can forgive sins except God? Notice what we find in Mark chapter 2 and verse 7. Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now let me ask you, does the Roman Catholic Church claim to have the power to forgive sins? You go to Roman Catholic cathedrals and churches and you find confessionals everywhere. Priests receive confession from the subject of the church. And they actually say that they have power to forgive the sins of the penitents. Let me read you a statement from St. Alphonsus Liguori, one of the 33 doctors of the Roman Catholic Church. This is in his famous book, Dignity and Duties of the Priest or Selva, page 28. Were the Redeemer to descend into a church and sit in a confessional to administer the sacrament of penance, and a priest to sit in another confessional, Jesus would say over each penitent, Ego te absolvo, which means I forgive you. The priest would likewise say over each of his penitents, Ego te absolvo. And the penitents of each would be equally absolved. Are you understanding what that statement is saying? It's saying that the priest has the same power as Jesus Christ to forgive sins. Notice what the Baltimore Catechism has to say. These are Roman Catholic publications. The priest does not have to ask God to forgive your sins. The priest himself has the power to do so in Christ's names. Your sins are forgiven by the priest, the same as if you knelt before Jesus Christ and told them to Christ himself. You're aware of the fact that Pope Francis I has proclaimed this year, the year of mercy. Actually, it's from December 8, 2015 through November 20, 2016. And he's even said that women who have aborted babies, if they're truly sorry for what they've done and they confess their sin to the priest, the priest can forgive their sin. The papacy certainly claims to have the power to forgive sin. That's one of the characteristics of the little horn. It speaks blasphemies against the Most High. But there's a second characteristic of blasphemy. Blasphemy is also when a mere human being claims to occupy the place of God on earth. Notice John chapter 10 and verses 30 to 33. John 10 verses 30 to 33. Here Jesus makes a revolutionary statement. I and my Father are one. Wow, that really made the religious leaders angry. It says in verse 31, Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you being a man, make yourself what? 
make yourself God. So when a mere man makes himself God or proclaims himself the representative of, uh, representative of God on earth, that is blasphemy. Incidentally, the popes call themselves vicarious Christi. That means, the word vicar means one who takes the place of. So vicarius Christi means one who takes the place of Christ. Last I knew, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit was going to take his place. Another name that the popes have claimed is vicarius fili Dei, which means vicar of the Son of God. Basically, it means he who takes the place of the Son of God or the substitute for the Son of God. That is blasphemy, folks. Let me read you some statements from, from church history. In an oration offered to the Pope in the fourth session of the Fifth Lateran Church Council, Christopher Marcellus stated the following about the Pope, and he's speaking to the Pope. For thou art the shepherd, thou art the physician, thou art the director, thou art the husbandman. Finally, thou art another God on earth. This is a Roman Catholic who is speaking about the Pope. Now, there's an interesting encyclopedia. It's called Prompta Bibliotheca. It was published in the middle of the 1800s. I have all eight volumes. They're very, very old. Uh, if you look up the article Papa, which is Pope, you're going to find something very interesting that is written in this Roman Catholic encyclopedia, which has the church imprimatur, which means it's, uh, it's an authorized publication of the Roman Catholic Church. Let me read you this statement, and you tell me if this is blasphemy. Moreover, the superiority and the power of the Roman pontiff by no means pertain only to the heavenly things, to the earthly things, and to the things under the earth, but are even over the angels than whom he is greater. So that if it were possible that the angels might err in the faith or might think contrary to the faith, they could be judged and excommunicated by the pope. For he is of so great dignity and power that he forms one and the same tribunal with Christ, so that whatever the Pope does seems to proceed from the mouth of God as according to most doctors, etc. The Pope is, as it were, God on earth, sole sovereign of the faithful of Christ, chief king of kings, having plenitude of power, to whom has been entrusted by the omnipotent God direction not only of the earthly, that's the state, by the way, but also of the heavenly kingdom. That's the church. The pope is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, or interpret even divine laws. The pope can modify divine law since his power is not of man but of God. And he acts as vice regent of God upon the earth with the most ample power of binding and loosing his sheep. Whatever the Lord God himself and the Redeemer is said to do that his vicar does, provided that he does, not, does nothing contrary to what? Contrary to the faith. That's blasphemy, folks. That's a claim of being the representative of God on earth, and in some cases, even God on earth. So does the papacy fulfill the fourth characteristic? Does it claim to occupy the place of God on earth, and in some statements, even claim to be God on earth? It most certainly does. That characteristic fits just like the first three. Now what about the next characteristic? Did the papacy persecute the saints of the Most High? This is where you'll find a lot of added material to what we have in the syllabus. Let me read you, first of all, what was said by Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest theologians, if not the greatest theologian, in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. He wrote this, But on the part of the church is mercy in view of the conversion of them that err. And therefore she does not condemn at once, but after the first and second admonition as the apostle teaches. After that, however, after the person is warned the first or the second time, if the man is still found pertinacious, that is obstinate, the church, having no hope of his conversion, provides for the safety of others, cutting him off from the church by the sentence of excommunication and further, she leaves him to the secular tribunal to be exterminated from the world by death. 
Incidentally, the other great pillar of Roman Catholic theology, St. Augustine, is the one that originated the idea that the church should use the state to destroy those that don't agree with the teachings and practices of the church. And I could have read you statements all from, also from St. Augustine. The papacy was guilty of persecuting the Hussites. Have you ever heard of the story of John Huss, how he was burnt at the stake? Well, his followers were persecuted mercilessly. Pope Martin V, who, uh, who ruled from 1417 to 1431, in 1429 he wrote a letter to the king of Poland, and he told him, you need to exterminate the Hussites. And now I'm reading from what this pope wrote. No, he's writing to this king. No, that the interests of the Holy See and those of your crown make it a duty to exterminate the Hussites. Remember that these impious persons dare proclaim, notice what they proclaimed. They proclaim principles of equality. They maintain that all Christians are brethren, like that's a big crime, right? And that God has not given to privileged men the right of ruling the nations. They hold that Christ came on earth to abolish slavery. They call the people to liberty, that is to the annihilation of kings and priests. While there is still time then, Turn your forces against Bohemia. That's where the Hussites were. Burn, massacre, make deserts everywhere, for nothing could be more agreeable to God or more useful to the cause of kings than the extermination of the Hussites. That is a Roman Catholic pope writing to the king of Poland. What about the persecution against the Waldensians, also known as the Waldenses? In the 15th century, in 1487, Pope Innocent VIII, uh, by the way, he was not real innocent, uh, <laughs> proclaimed a bull, that is a personal letter, against the Waldensians or against the Waldenses. In the bull, the Pope referred to the Waldensians as that malicious and abominable sect of malignants and stated that if they refused to abjure, that is to recant, they should be crushed like venomous snakes. Who could forget the so-called Piedmont Massacre? By the way, I've been there in this very place of what I'm going to tell you now. 1655, actually January 25, 1655, the Duke of Savoy gave an edict against the Waldensians. He said they must either convert or leave the valleys and have their properties confiscated. And if they didn't, they would be subject to the death decree. I want to read you now a statement from a very valuable book which we have here at Secrets Unsealed. We carry Heresy Columbus and the Inquisition, written by Salim Hapas, an old friend. He died a few years ago, but a very committed Christian. He wrote this, On April 17th, 15,000 soldiers invaded the valleys of the Piedmont. Thousands of Waldensians were murdered, tortured, and enslaved. Hundreds who were able to escape to the most rugged areas of the mountains were caught and thrown off the jagged cliff of Mount Cateluso near Torre Pellice. I've been there. I've been at that very ledge where they threw off dozens of Waldensians because they did not agree with the teachings and the practices of the church. What could we say about the St. Bartholomew Massacre? which took place August 24, 1572, orchestrated by Pope Gregory XIII at the tolling of a bell. The Huguenots in France were murdered without mercy. 70,000 men, women, and children perished. The Huguenots were the professionals of the day. They were what the French would say, la creme de la creme of France. At the news of the massacre, Pope Gregory XIII attended the, uh, with his cardinals and other ecclesiastical dignitaries a long procession to the church of St. Louis where the Cardinal of Lorraine chanted a te deum. That means an anthem of praise to God. Incidentally, a medal was struck to commemorate the massacre. On one side of the medal is the face of Pope Gregory XIII and on the other side is the image of the destroying angel. If you want to know how the Inquisition functioned, you need to read this book. 
It's unbelievable how this mechanism persecuted people, mercilessly tortured people simply because they did not agree with the practices and the theology of the church. The Inquisition was established in the 12th century. And during the pontificate of Innocent XIV, which uh, he ruled from 1241 to 1253, the Inquisition was refined. And I'm going to talk now about a papal bull called Ad Extirpanda. It was uh, proposed in the year 1252 by Pope Innocent XIV. And these are some of the provisions that you find in that particular personal letter of the Pope. Number one, torture must be applied to heretics so as to secure confessions. Number two, those found guilty must be burned at the stake. Number three, this is the Pope that is saying this, by the way. Number three, a police force must be established to serve the needs of the Inquisition. Number four, a proclamation of a crusade against all heretics in Italy. And those who participated in this crusade were given the same privileges and indulgences as those who went on crusades to the Holy Land. Finally, the heirs of heretics were to have their goods confiscated as well as the goods that belonged to the heretic himself. It's interesting to read what Peter de Rosa, a Roman Catholic, wrote in his book, Vicars of Christ, pages 175 and 176. Listen to this. Of 80 popes in a line from the 13th century on, not one of them disapproved of the theology and apparatus of the Inquisition. On the contrary, one after another added his own cruel touches to the workings of this deadly machine. Let me read you this statement from a 14th century inquisitor, Bernard Guy. This is what he wrote. The objective of the Inquisition is to destroy heresy. It is not possible to destroy heresy unless you eradicate the heretics. And it is impossible to eradicate the heretics unless you also eradicate those who hide them, sympathize with them, and protect them. So you not only persecute the heretic, you also torture the heretic to find out who sympathizes with the heretic, is what he's saying. Now, Juan Antonio Llorente, a Spaniard, who was actually the secretary of the Inquisition in Madrid, had some interesting things to, to say about the Inquisition. He kind of had a conversion experience. Let me read you these two statements. I was the secretary of the Inquisition in the court of Madrid in the years 1789, 1790, and 1791. I knew the establishment well enough to refute it. It was vicious in its origin constitution and laws in spite of the apologies which have been written in its favor. He also wrote, the horrid conduct of this holy office, which is the name of the Inquisition, weakened the power and diminished the population of Spain by arresting the progress of the arts, sciences, industry, and commerce, and by compelling multitudes of families to abandon the kingdom by instigating the expulsion of the Jews and Moors, and by immolating on its flaming shambles more than 300,000 victims. This is written by a Roman Catholic who was an inquisitor. He was a secretary of the Inquisition in Spain. He wrote several volumes documenting what the Roman Catholic Church did in the Inquisition. I wish I had time to go through the next material in the syllabus. You know, for many years, I had uh, desired to visit one specific spot in Peru. And a few years ago, I was invited to speak at the Seventh-day Adventist University near, in Lima, near Lima. And uh, I wanted to visit the Palace of the Inquisition because I'd heard that there was an interesting exhibition there. And so one afternoon, they took me to visit this Palace of the Inquisition in the city of Lima. Incidentally, the Inquisition functioned in three Latin American countries. It functioned in Colombia, it functioned in Mexico, and of course, it functioned in Peru. Uh, as we entered the Palace of the Inquisition, as you look on the right-hand side, you find this large mural or this large uh, depiction 
of what is called an auto de fe. In other words, they're, they're actually doing an examination of the heretic. They're in the plaza, de armas, and if he's found guilty, they're going to burn him there at the stake. It's interesting how this uh, young man, who was our tour guide, simply described that what it, whoever didn't agree with the teachings and practices of the church, you know, they were uh, tied to the stake, <clears throat> and then they were burned alive. <clears throat> you can read in the material the different torture instruments that were, were used by the Inquisition there in Peru. In fact, after looking at this large mural on the right-hand side, you take a left and you go into the torture chamber. There you have, and you can read this at your leisure, there you have the strapado, you have the whipping post, you have the rack, the garrote, waterboarding was used. Also, you've heard of waterboarding, right? And then they took us beyond the torture chamber. By the way, they have all of the implements, samples of all the implements, and how they were used to torture people, to get them to recant, and also to uh, tell who sympathized with their ideas. Next, you found these little, uh, these little uh, cubicles that were hewn in the rock, where individuals suspected of heresy were enclosed in these little cubicles hewn in the rock. I mean, they were barely large enough for the individual to, to uh, fit in there, all curled up. And they were kept in the dark and in the cold. Their family knew not where they were for days and sometimes for months they were kept in there, just barely alive. That is the history of the Roman Catholic system. Let me read you some other statements from other Roman Catholic thinkers. Cardinal Robert Bellarmine. One of the enemies of the Protestant Reformation. He was a champion of the Counter-Reformation. Notice what he wrote. By the way, he lived from 1542 to 1621. He wrote, The only effective means against heretics is to convey them to that place provided for them as quickly as possible. In this way, one is only doing them a favor. As the longer they are allowed to live, the more heresies they will devise and thus the more believers they will seduce, aggravating their own damnation. Pius IX wrote an encyclical letter in uh, December 8, 1864, and this is what he wrote. Cursed be they who assert liberty of conscience and of worship, and such as maintain the church should not employ, for, employ force. The state has not the right to leave every man free to embrace whatever religion he may deem true. Interesting that a pope would say such things against religious liberty, saying that you, the state cannot allow people to choose the religion that they want to follow. Pope Leo XIII added his testimony in his encyclical, encyclical Libertas Humanan. This is what he wrote. From what has been said, it follows that it is quite unlawful to demand, to defend, or to grant unconditional freedom of thought, of speech, of writing, or of worship, as if these were so many rights given by nature to man. Here's another statement by Marianos de Luca, a Jesuit and formerly a professor of canon law at the Gregorian University in Rome. That's where priests are educated. Notice what he wrote. The Catholic Church has the right and duty to kill heretics because it is by fire and sword that heresy can be extirpated. Mass excommunication is derided by heretics. If they are imprisoned or exiled, they corrupt others. The only recourse is to put them to death. Repentance cannot be allowed to save civil criminals, for the highest good of the Church is the duty of the faith, and this cannot be preserved unless heretics are what? are put to death. And this is a theology teacher teaching priests in the Pontif Pontifical University. He further remarked the following, heretics despise excommunication and say that that bolt is powerless. If you threaten them with a pecuniary fine, they neither fear God nor respect men, knowing that they will find fools enough to believe them and support them. If you imprison them or send them into exile, they corrupt those near them with their words and those at a distance with their books. So the only remedy is to send them soon to their own place. And of course the question is, what is their own place? Well, he explains by quoting Tanner. 
in the next statement. The civil magistrate, by the command and commission of the church, ought to punish the heretic with what? With the penalty of death. Notice this, this statement from Alfred Baudrillard. He was a French cardinal. These are no slouches of the Roman Catholic Church. These are popes and cardinals of the church and teachers at the Gregorian University that are writing these things. Notice what he said. The church has, and she loudly proclaims, that she has a horror of blood. Nevertheless, when confronted by heresy, she does not content herself with persuasion. Arguments of an intellectual and moral order appear to her insufficient. And she has recourse to force, to corporeal punishment, to torture. She creates tribunal, tribunals like those of the Inquisition. She calls the laws of the state to her aid. If necessary, she encourages a crusade or a religious war. And all her horror of blood practically culminates into urging the secular power to shed it, which proceeding is almost more odious, for it is less frank than shedding it herself. In other words, it's much easier to get the state to shed it and then blame the state and say, we didn't do it. He continues writing, especially did the church act thus in the 16th century with regard to Protestants, not content to reform morally, to preach by example, to convert people by eloquent and holy missionaries, she lit in Italy, in the low countries, and above all in Spain, the funeral pyres of the Inquisition. In France, under Francis I and Henry II, in England, under Mary Tudor, she tortured heretics, while both in France and Germany, during the second half of the 16th and the first half of the 17th century, if she did not actually begin, at any rate, she, she encouraged and actively aided in the religious wars. Notice what Alexis M. Lepicier had to say. Once again, a cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church. He wrote, He who publicly avows a heresy and tries to pervert others by word or example, speaking absolutely, can not only be excommunicated, but even justly put to death lest he ruin others by pestilential contagion. For a bad man is worse than a wild beast and does more harm, as Aristotle says. Hence, as it is not wrong to kill a wild beast which does great harm, so it must be right to deprive of his harmful life a heretic who withdraws from divine truth and plots against the salvation of others. Are you following this? This is not one or two statements from nobodies. This is popes and cardinals. And the history shows that the papacy persecuted without mercy those who did not agree with her. The Catholic Encyclopedia therefore uh, says and admits that this is a dark period of the history of the Roman Catholic Church. Judged by contemporary standards, the Inquisition, especially as it developed in Spain toward the close of the Middle Ages, can be classified only as one of the darker chapters in the history of the church. There have been papal apologies. At St. Peter's Basilica, on the first Sunday of Lent, March 12, 2000, Pope John Paul II, in a carefully choreographed mass, leaning against the crucifix with an agonizing voice, seemed to apologize for the sins of the church against Protestants, Jews, non-Christians, immigrants, ethnic minorities, women, abused children, and the unborn. He actually mentions all of these groups and is apologizing for the way in which the Roman Catholic Church treated them. And now I read one of the, pa one of the uh, points that he mentioned. It's a long letter that he wrote, actually. We forgive and we ask your forgiveness. We cannot recognize the betray. We cannot but recognize the betrayals of the gospel committed by some of our brothers, especially during the second millennium. We ask forgiveness for the divisions between Christians, for the use of violence that some have resorted to in the service of truth. Notice he doesn't say that it was in the service of error. He says in the service of truth. 
and for the acts of dissidence and of hostility sometimes taken towards followers of other religions. But in this long letter, he never admits that it was the church that persecuted. He says, some of our brothers persecuted. That led the editor of the New York Times to write this about this document that the Pope wrote. The document should have put it in bold print that children of the church includes popes, cardinals, and clergy, and not just people in the pews. The Pope had a great idea that some in the Vatican are obscuring with a fog machine. There was also an apology by Pope Francis I, and this is amazing. He actually traveled to Torre Pellice, the place where the Waldensians actually lived. And on June 22, 2015, just last year, he spoke at this oldest evangelical church of the Waldensians. And now I read what he said to them. On the part of the Catholic Church, I ask your forgiveness. I ask it for the non-Christian and even inhuman attitudes and behavior that we have showed you. In other words, he's apologizing to the Waldensians. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, forgive us. And so some people say, see, the papacy is repentant and sorry for what it has done. We're going to study a little bit later on in our series that the papacy is going to act in the future in the same way that it acted in the past. Bible prophecy tells us that that is going to happen. So the facade that the papacy is presenting today of being a, a forgiving church, begging for forgiveness, and saying we're sorry for what we've done is only a way to gain the confidence of people until the papacy can once again regain power. Now we're going to study characteristic number six and we're going to leave number seven for our next lecture because our next lecture is going to deal with the time period, time, times, and the dividing of time. So let's cover point number six. Does the papacy claim to have changed God's holy law? Yes, in two ways. One way indirectly and in another way directly. If you read the Roman Catholic Bibles, you're going to find the second commandment just like it is in Protestant Bibles. It says, don't make images and don't bow before the images. That's in Roman Catholic Bibles. But when you go to Roman Catholic catechisms, that commandment is gone. It's not in the catechisms. And you say, why would, would it be in the Roman Catholic Bible and not be in the catechisms? Very simple. If it was in the catechisms, which are used to teach children so that they can receive First Communion, uh, if they saw that commandment in the catechism, they say, well, now wait a minute, there's a contradiction here. It says don't make images and don't bow before the images. Why then do we have so many images in the church? And why do we bow before the images? So the Roman Catholic Church excludes the second commandment from the catechisms, even though it's found in the Roman Catholic Bible, and most Roman Catholics don't actually read the Bible. So many of them are definitely surprised when they discover that the second commandment says don't make images and don't bow before them. But the biggest change that the Roman Catholic system has made in God's law is that it openly says we have changed by the authority of Jesus Christ the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday. The Roman Catholic Church claims, and we're going to look at this more carefully later on in a future lecture, the Roman Catholic Church, without apology, says openly, popes, cardinals, theologians, and teachers of theology clearly say, we changed the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday. Allow me to read you a statement from St. Thomas Aquinas. St. Thomas Aquinas is the greatest theologian in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. St. Augustine would probably be a close rival of Thomas Aquinas, but Aquinas, no doubt, is the greatest theologian uh, in Roman Catholicism. Notice what he said about the day of worship. In the new law, the keeping of Sunday supplants that of the Sabbath, not in virtue of the precept of the law, in other words, it's not found in the Bible, but through determination by the church and the custom of the Christian people. So he's saying, 
Sunday is the day of worship, not because the Bible says it's Sunday, but because the church and the people decided that Sunday would be the new day of worship. My Bible begs to differ. My Bible tells me that the Sabbath was created by God at the very beginning before sin. It's part of God's original plan. It's in the fourth commandment of God's holy law. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Jesus Christ kept the Sabbath. He went to the synagogue as was his custom on the Sabbath day. The apostles, according to the book of Acts, kept the seventh day Sabbath as the day of rest. There is no vestige in the Bible that the day of worship was ever changed or that we're supposed to honor Sunday because Jesus resurrected that day or that Sunday is particularly holy because of Christ's resurrection. And yet the Roman Catholic Church, time and again, and later on in this series, I'm going to read you a series of statements. They say, we, by the authority that Jesus Christ conceded to the Roman Catholic Church, we have changed the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday. The Bible says that the little horn would think that it could change God's what? It could change God's law. So let me ask you, do all of the characteristics fit the Roman Catholic Church? Absolutely. Number one, what was number one? Do you remember? Number one, it was going to arise after the ten kingdoms were complete. Is that true? Yes. It was going to arise in Western Europe, more specifically from Rome. Is that true? It was going to uproot three of the ten kingdoms, the three rebellious kingdoms. That's true. Does the papacy speak blasphemies by claiming to forgive sins and by the Pope claiming to be the representative of Christ on earth? Absolutely. Does the papacy have a long history of persecution? Yes, it does. Does the papacy claim to have changed God's day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday? Absolutely. Now there's one characteristic that we did not cover from this lesson. We're going to look at it in our next, le next lecture, and that is the period that the Roman Catholic papacy ruled during the time that it did all of these things that we're talking about. The Bible says that the papacy would rule for time, times, and the dividing of time. You say, what in the world could that ever mean? Time, times, and the dividing of time. In Revelation, it's described as 42 months. And in Revelation chapter 12, it's called 1,260 days. Three parallel expressions, 1,260 days, 42 months, and time, times, and the dividing of time. And in our next study together, I'm going to show you that the papacy ruled exactly the time that this prophecy says. It ruled for 1,260 years from the time it rose to power till the time that it received a deadly wound according to Revelation chapter 13. So the last characteristic also fits the papacy like glove in hand. So are you clear on what we've studied so far? The prophetic chain, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire, the divided Roman Empire, and then from the divided Roman Empire, or in its midst, rises the little horn with all of these characteristics and rules for 1,260 years. So don't miss for anything in the world the next exciting episode. All right. Uh, any questions?